I must thank the organizers as we begin this important conversation again at the heart of Delhi University at one of the very prestigious colleges, SRCC. And uh, thank you everyone who is uh, graceful enough to attend this session. And uh, as we sit together um, on this stage, I must in the very beginning uh, put this forth that um, this book is a contribution to a lot that has already been written on Kashmir, a lot that discourse already has on Kashmir. And I contribute my part to the plethora of writing, to the plethora of discourse that has already been articulated. So this is not something new that I'm telling to the world out there, but this is my experience as the third generation in exile. And as we would continue talking, and I would uh, also uh, ask Aditya ji to further elaborate his experiences as the second generation. So this is a transgenerational or, the, or an intergenerational trauma that each one of us has carried. And this is what the book is. And uh, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's uh, glad to be here again with Anisha. I was here a few months back at the Hansraj College to actually launch this fantastic book called They Have a Name for It, a poetic memoir by Anisha Kaul. I actually ask you all to please visit the book stalls and order it or otherwise go online and order it. It's a very powerful uh, tribute uh, to a place that we both uh, immensely love, we live afar from. Uh, but we are attached to our roots and will remain always. 19 January 1990 uh, really instills uh, a lot of bad memories for us because 34 years ago, uh, our families, uh, me, uh, together had to leave Kashmir because of the eruption of unfortunate terrorism, uh, selective targeting of minorities there. And only yesterday, we marked the 34th anniversary Last evening, midnight, I was speaking at a panel discussion uh, organized by the K UK Kashmiri Pandit diaspora, the Indian diaspora in UK, with the UK parliamentarians, Bob Blackman, Jonathan Lord, and Virinder Sharma. How Kashmiri Hindus not only had to leave their homeland after meeting ethnic cleansing and genocide, but the selective silence that happened after that for years together. It took decades and decades for the world and for the country in particular, and perhaps even the Hindus to realize that this is what had happened to Kashmiri Hindus. There was some kind of a phobia. There was some kind of a reluctance to accept the trauma that the Kashmiri Hindus went through. And I have seen it all. I mean, the kind of selective behavior by the media that I am now part of, the intelligentsia, the intellectuals all across, the academicians, in Delhi University, in JNU, in Jamia, all across the country. My sister, almost 15 years or 16 years back, was applying for her, I think, PhD in JNU. And she chose a topic on post-exodus literature of Kashmiri Hindus, Kashmiri Pandits. And the professor that she was applying it under told her that this is fake. What are you actually uh, talking about? This genocide or ethnic cleansing or forced exodus of Kashmiri Pandits never happened. Now imagine this was the state of the academicians in India, that, in the, that too in the heart of the national capital, inside JNU, they wouldn't admit that, you know, Kashmiri Hindus actually met ethnic cleansing. And unfortunately, a few years back, I think, was it 2016 or 17, when we had those slogans, Bharat Tere Tukde Honge, Inshallah, Inshallah. Imagine the kind of behavior uh, that actually happened there. And I'm glad that the police and the government acted at that particular time because I'm all for freedom of expression. I'm all for criticizing the government. I'm all for asking questions to Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Home Minister Amit Shah and everybody else. But that does not mean that you go against the trauma that a community actually faces, the agony that the families and the minuscule minority of Kashmir actually faced in the Kashmir Valley. And you deny it completely for years together. And this book, they have a name for it, by Anisha Call, is an example, is testimony to what our fears have been, what our longing really is for all these years, what my grandparents, what her grandparents have gone through, and what they have been thinking all these years, that one day, that ancestral home of ours, that's empty today, that deity that is there, waiting for us to return 
home someday. So Anisha, let me begin by actually asking you, before we come to the book, uh, about your own conversations with your grandparents. You know, uh, how hard has it been for you? Because I'm not sure if you've gone back to Kashmir to this the same alleys and you know uh, homes in Srinagar and other places, the Dal Lake, the Gulmarg, the Pehlgam, uh, the Shankracharya, the Kheer Bhavani, the Hari Parbat. But what have they told you? What kind of stories every day? What kind of longing and hope uh, and perhaps some kind of confidence that they have built inside you? So, um, as young as I was in my school days, I knew that I belonged here but not here. I knew that home was not particularly the time and place that I was in. And uh, when I uh, spoke to my grandmother, I remember that she used to speak in a little broken Hindi. She was not very fluent in Hindi and so was I not very fluent in Kashmiri. So we had a language barrier to begin with. She had to communicate her culture, her language, her ethnicity to me in a language that was not known to her and to me as well. So we began this journey and we met halfways wherein she taught me what she knew of home and the home that she had built, the home the entire family had built. And I come from a place um, in Kashmir, Pulwama, which is very unfamously known nowadays after the infamous attack that had happened in Pulwama. And uh, you know the crisis that was there at that time and you know the crisis that still is in present situation. Although a lot has changed, we have come afar. But yet, the problem is there and still within the hearts of those who, of us who have been victims of a tragedy which, again, the entire world decided to deny us. And uh, they told me of stories, how they had lived their childhood, the stories which I wanted to be a part of. I knew that my childhood was um, sort of snatched away from the very moment I came to know of uh, the Kashmir that they had built. And as they told me of uh, the folk tales that they used to sing, the songs that they, they used to sing in marriages and rituals and birthdays, all of that. And I recognized that all of this is lost to me. How can I become a part of it? And then the introspection began. It was not just my outward things that I did in life, the literature that I read and consumed, but it was also an introspection that went into me. And therefore, my writing journey began wherein I thought that, you know, it is very important to reflect on the emotion that I'm feeling and not to be very saddened about the fact that, you know, the entire community is still struggling. And as Aditya rightly pointed out, it has been 34 long years. An entire generation has passed. I was born in exile. I inherited the exile. And that's what my identity is. Aditya, I, if I'm not wrong, he was a month old when his parents wrapped him in a cloth to protect him from terrorists, from shooting him down, his parents down. That is the Kashmir we left from. And that is the Kashmir we go back to. I don't have a physical home standing in Pulwama. It's not there. It was looted. It was burned down. It's a ground that I go back to. So it is a rather difficult journey, a little psychologically traumatizing that we go back. But yet, what they installed in me is not anger. What they installed me is not hopelessness. They gave me hope. The fact that you go back and you build like Phoenix from scratch. You don't agonize the people who were against you. You remember, but you do not forget. You remember what had happened to you so that the same things that had happened. This was the seventh genocide, not the last one. I am afraid because it's still happening. It's the latest in the records that we have. But again, when we go back, we go back hopeful with our integrity in, intact. We go back with our identities intact. And that's what they taught me. And that's what I am telling the world. We are very uh, optimistic, not pessimistic at all. And uh, the fact that uh, all the agencies and all the governmental activities, the peer groups that are working, the NGOs that are working towards the Kashmiri Hindu cause, we are also on the process. And I think very well that in our lifetime or in a generation or so, we'll be on track. So, so that's the hope that we are moving to. Anisha said something very important and that is that we do not have anger within us. We do have trauma, uh, we are emotional, we have a longing, uh, 
there is a certain amount of anger in the sense that history could have been different if the government of india at that particular time had behaved differently if the people of india uh, perhaps in a mass movement had behaved differently but we are subjects and you know we have to follow uh, whatever history has in the past and you know uh, go along with it uh, but it's important to rekindle that hope and have faith uh, that we will return home one day uh, if i could just add yeah. to that point i mean uh, i've been asked enough that why did you not retaliate the fact that you were a community of four like five, five lakh people i said we didn't pick up arms we were not taught to pick up arms the way that you know the uh, the subjugated in a sense in the academic discourses put in like those who are suppressed oppressed to whatever definition one knows they pick up arms and they retaliate and we said we did not we brought Uh, whatever adjusted had to be to be uh, in the limelight and we were have been talking about it we have been doing things about it we have been rehabilitating people about the fact that you know kashmir has not to be lost it is on the shoulders of these kashmiri hindus that are still surviving in kashmir living in kashmir with whatever they can and even if they are a very minuscule number thousands of them that's i suppose our way to home if if not anything else that's our hope to home absolutely and in fact it's important for you all also to hear this on kashmir because uh, a lot of factual information doesn't come out uh, in this haze of social media and of course uh, television media print etc a lot of factual information from primary sources primary victims doesn't really come out and that's why it's important for you to directly interact uh, with the victims uh, those who have gone through it those who continue to go through it Uh, who will tell you the real picture uh, and this argument has been thrown at me time and again that uh, you know kaise hindu ho tum tumne to bandook nahi uthai tumhe to ladna chahiye tha wahan par utha ke marna chahiye tha apna haq jo hai chheenna chahiye tha but we are not a community of fighters i'm sorry uh, and fighting doesn't mean that you have to pick up a gun and kill uh, the person who is attempting to kill you or coming at you fighting also means picking up the pen fighting also means intellectually fighting fighting also means hitting the streets and protesting and not actually looking the other way until your demands have actually met we have been fighting for the last 34 years we've been demanding justice and unfortunately the government hasn't done much uh, when it comes to justice for kashmiri pandits and these are successive governments that have come uh, in the last 30 years yes very progressive steps have been taken in kashmir finally uh you know phenomenal historic steps ever since 2017 when the national investigative agency was given the mandate to investigate cases and go after the perpetrators separatists terror terrorists the hawala funding that happened in kashmir that actually gave a lot of sponsorship and push uh to terror attacks stone pelting etc in the kashmir valley and 2019 we saw the historic step of article 370 abrogation happening on 5th august 2019 Uh, which brought a brought in a lot of policy changes you know imagine uh, that women uh, and girls in the kashmir valley and all across jammu and kashmir and ladakh if they had married outside jammu and kashmir and ladakh if they had married with anybody else in india or world a french person or a person from kerala uh, kolkata madhya pradesh anywhere they would have lost the property right imagine such was the discriminatory uh, means of article 370 and 35a one more important discrimination was against the valmiki uh, community uh, that was settled in uh, jammu and kashmir for the last many decades particularly from punjab the sons and daughters of the valmiki community in jnk were not given any other job they couldn't apply in any other government job other than sweeping being sweepers in the municipality of jammu and kashmir imagine such was the discrimination that the politicians of jnk from national conference pdp and other parties were presiding over and they didn't have any problems with it such blatant open discrimination was happening in an india of uh, 2019 at that particular time and when the supreme court of india heard this for the first time they couldn't imagine that this was actually happening so that is the kind of justice and equality that has been restored now in jammu and kashmir and in the last four and a half years if you actually study the pattern of terrorism radicalization and infiltration in the kashmir valley you will see a declining trend now i
today because I cover national security and foreign affairs and strategic affairs that terrorism had nothing to do, radicalization had nothing to do with Article 370. Many politicians will come out, they have come out in the last five years and said that Article 370 chala gaya, to They have nothing to do with each other. But Article 370 still has had an impact on the society, uh, on the people and of course with our friends across the border who've been rushing in terrorists for the last 30 years. The infiltration has come down. Radicalization still is happening, unfortunately, but is happening low. Terror attacks are low ever since the Pulwama terror attack that happened on 14 Feb 2019. So these are positive signs. There's no stone pelting happening in the Kashmir Valley. It, it used to be difficult when you go, went to Kashmir to pass through the Jamia Masjid area, Nauhatta uh, in Srinagar, and of course in Shopia, in Pulwama, uh, in Kulgam and other places because every time there used to be an encounter with terrorists or any kind of a law and order situation, there used to be massive stone pelting at the security forces. I've been caught uh, in between stone pelting several times uh, in the Kashmir Valley. My cars have been attacked several times. But that stone pelting is not happening because there's a sense of fear of the law of the land now uh, in the people in Kashmir that if we actually take the law onto our hands, there will be consequences. Uh, so that has been... The faith has been restored. There is some investment also happening, but a lot more needs to be done by the government of India in terms of creating job opportunities, creating high-class education institutions in the Kashmir Valley, uh, helping the hospitality and the tourism industry, and also uh, creating more private hospitals, government hospitals uh, in Kashmir and as well as in Jammu. What also happened you know, over the last many years is a open, blatant discrimination, particularly not just with Kashmiri pundits, but with Gujars, with Bakarwals, with people in Jammu in particular and Ladakh. You know, if you speak to Dogras in Jammu or the Sikh community in Jammu or uh, the people in Ladakh, they'll tell you that there was a com complete hegemony of the Kashmiri politicians uh, in the government affairs, in the bureaucracy and otherwise. And people of Jammu, uh, they didn't care about. Uh, in the government affairs, in policies, in investments, in any kind of other policies that used to be uh, there in the government of India. But... Uh, I'm glad that there is uh, a peace being given a chance now, finally. Uh, unfortunately, our neighbors will continue to really sponsor terrorists, but I'm sure that the Indian Army, the BSF, the CRPF, and above all, the Jammu and Kashmir police uh, have been there, uh, you know, creating a safe environment in the Kashmir Valley, uh, maintaining the best practices uh, and policies of the police force and the army. Uh, but there's much more that we need to achieve in the valley, uh, and that means creating development, not just infrastructure in the forms of bridges and trains and connectivity, but actually the people of Kashmir should feel a sense that these are changing times. We are Indians first and government of India, people of India, uh, New Delhi will stand for them every time they are in some kind of uh, trouble. That does not mean that in the last 60 or 70 years, the kind of special status that Jammu and Kashmir enjoyed should continue. Jammu and Kashmir is a part of India similar to other states and union territories. So why should it get a special status? And one misnomer or notion that has been there every time is that Article 370 and 35A was permanent in nature. It wasn't. The very first page of the Article 370 said that this was temporary in nature. I'm glad and I am thank the Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachud, and the Constitution Bench that actually gave a historic, remarkable verdict uh, actually a slap on the face of all those radicals and separatists and even politicians in Kashmir who use the common masses for their own vested interests, narrow interests. Imagine you go to, I'll not take names, I'm happy to take names, I don't care if they actually file defamation cases against me. I've, I've been, uh, you know, slapped cases in the past and I've won those cases. But, uh, you know, these politicians, if you actually see their wealth and they haven't worked one day in their life, uh, and the kind of wealth and the newest cars that they have, they own half of Kashmir, the two political parties that they're in in Kashmir. Unfortunately, the corrup corruption uh, is a part of, uh, you know, the daily life in India. Uh, it's happening all across the India, so I can't just put fingers in the Kashmir Valley. But again, there's a glimmer of hope now that uh, the government has realized that the policies that were in there till now uh, were not working, so there had to be a paradigm shift. And I think Pulwama attack, in a way, was that last nail in the coffin, where the government of India actually realized, and particularly the Prime Minister and the Home Minister, that things are not going to work this way. Uh, we need to have an iron fist, 
uh, and change dramatically our policies. And I think it was that very evening that a call was taken that Article 370 has to go. And only a handful of people uh, in Government of India knew about it. I'm glad uh, to be a small uh, peck, a small part of this entire process that Government of India took me as a consultant. And I actually submitted a report on how uh, things need to change and policies need to change in the Kashmir Valley. And I'm glad that most of it has been adopted, but it's a long process. In, in India, unfortunately, we have a short memory. And uh, what happens is that when there are policy changes, there needs to be consistency for a change to actually happen. Uh, that consistency needs to be there. And that's how we will bring in a change in Kashmir Valley. But uh, not delving too much into politics of it, Anisha, yet again, I want to ask you, why this book? Uh, you know, I know we have had a chat about it uh, when we actually released this book. But for the people here, uh, is this to reflect your pain and, you know, convey to the people uh, what you actually went through? Or is it to actually note down those memories that your grandparents, parents and relatives have told you all these years? But because perhaps you haven't yourself experienced that, but through their stories, through their words, you want to put it on paper and for the for the generations to actually see yeah so uh, as you have rightly pointed out it is both a when i was going through their journeys i felt that you know one has to take a part one has to take the call and uh, the amnesia that you were talking about there's a selective amnesia in our country you know you tend to forget some things and you tend to remember some other things you will remember some things like, say, suppose, you know that you need to vocalize those who are unvoiced. But as Aditya was rightly pointing out, what of the Valmiki Samaj? Did we remember vocalizing them when we were asking for equal rights and everything? When we in campuses argue about everyone has to have an equal right, were we also speaking of them? Were we also speaking of the LGBTQ when we were speaking of them? Uh, Kashmir mein kya LGBTQ ko wohi equal rights mil rahe hain jo aap Delhi mein argue kar rahe hain. So were we doing that? Or for that matter, were we also remembering the Kashmiri Pandits, the Kashmiri Hindu community entirely, of their uh, sufferings, the fact that none of the cases or most of the cases have been still under covers. The fact that people on their own have been investigating of who murdered their loved ones. Is this the victim's call to sort of find out uh, what had happened to their parents and their fathers and their mothers? Who kidnapped who? Who killed whom? Was the government agency then not responsible for the records? Were people who were fle fleeing home, saving their lives, supposed to go and make FIRs about the fact that they were being looted, killed, kidnapped. So the fact that there has to be record, you know, I have been asked and many Kashmiri Hindus have been asked ki ye sach mein hua tha? the fact that you have a popular discourse movie now on uh, this particular issue, there's a lot of awareness. But before that particular movie, that particular director coming up in mainstream media and showcasing all that had happened, so even that got questioned, the fact that it is a fiction, the fact that all this had not happened. So when we as victims or uh, not victims per se, but survivors of the genocide are still here, we are being questioned of the fact that this had not happened. What of will happen when all of us would be done and dusted with? These words and these books will remain. And generations to come will at least have a glimmer of hope that, you know, there's a other side of the story. This is the other side of the story that we all are trying to say. This is the other side of the story that we all are trying to bring onto students like you, who have been also in the entire politics of it. Who Everyone is an expert on Kashmir, trust me. So, just to bring and highlight this point that, you know, the entire conversation has to be very contextual. You need to know wherein one stands and you need to know the idea behind writing a book and th that was my idea of contextualizing Kashmir and bringing it to my students to my peer groups to my friends to my family so that's that's where I pitched it I'll just make yeah. a quick one minute point and then we can go to the Q&A and this is about uh, the selective amnesia that she talked about but more about the kind of propaganda disinformation <clears throat> happened over the years you know, there's been a theory that separatists in particular in Kashmir and Islamists have propounded 
and that is that no kashmiri pandits did not meet any kind of exodus what they actually met was they themselves decided to leave and the government of india helped them and in particular governor jagmohan actually helped them to leave now this is absolutely crap this is absolutely came up with the red carpet for us and yeah. then we walked on that red carpet and out of kashmir that's yeah. what people feel i i mean i give this example to a lot of people a few years ago there were riots in delhi and you know will you actually uh, handhold people and ask them to leave completely that area yes maybe for a few days they might have stepped out and gone a few kilometers away but that does not mean for 34 years the entire population of delhi will leave that area because riots happened in mangolpuri or north delhi or some other place so the question here is that why was this allowed to be uh, circulated and never checked why did the successive governments in power in india not question the kind of propaganda that was uh, being meted by these uh, people of horiyat and once this film the kashmir files by vivek agnihotri actually came in all hell broke loose from the leftists to the islamists to even centrists questioning that this is all false this never happened why i mean there are primary sources that are coming out vivek has spoken to more than 200 or 300 victim families or people uh, you know who have relatives been killed uh, by jklf hizbul mujahideen and other terrorists so the fight is very much on my friend i'm glad that you could join today to hear our plight on our 34th uh, anniversary unfortunately of the brutal exodus uh, we commemorate uh, yesterday and today uh, but as i say this is a good fight and we will continue to fight this until the day that we return to kashmir absolutely any questions we are happy to answer sir main aapka bahut bahut dhanyawad karna chahunga sir pratham kyunki jaise aapne kashmiri aur kashmiri panditon ke bare mein bataya us tarike se maine bahut bahut lambe samay baad suna is tarike se khul kar bol pana अपनी बात को बहुत दृढ़ता से रख पाना सच में बहुत साहसिक कार्य है आ, मेरा प्रश्न आपसे ये है कि आ, कश्मीरी और कश्मीरी पंडितों की जो स्थिति है टेलीविजन पे उसको किस तरीके से दिखाने में किस तरीके की परेशानियों की और दिक्कतों का सामना करना पड़ता है क्योंकि मीडिया एक बहुत बड़ा रोल अदा करती है तो वो चैलेंजेस मैं जानना चाहता हूँ कि किस तरीके से आती है आपके आपका नाम सर मेरा नाम विशेक है और मैं दिल्ली विश्वविद्यालय का एक छात्र हूँ बहुत धन्यवाद शेख सबसे पहले तो ये आ, बहुत ही अच्छा सवाल आपने पूछा क्योंकि आ, ये मेरा एक प्रश्न चिन्ह है हमेशा से और ये प्रश्न ये है कि मीडिया ने खासकर जो हमारी प्रेस है जिसको हम फोर्थ पिलर ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन कहते हैं उन्होंने क्यों प्रश्न नहीं उठाए उस वक्त उन्होंने क्यों पूरी तरीके से एक म्यूट स्पेक्टेटर वो रहे और आसान नहीं है मेरे लिए तो बिल्कुल आसान नहीं रहा है ये सफ़र मैं सिक्योरिटी के साथ घूमता हूँ क्योंकि बहुत सारी थ्रेट्स आतंकवादी संगठनों से मिली हैं लेकिन ये आपने अच्छा सवाल इसलिए पूछा क्योंकि सबसे बड़ा जो हमारी पेन रही है वो यही रही है कि पिछले तीस सालों में मीडिया ने सवाल नहीं उठाए और मैं आपको एग्जाम्पल ये भी देता हूँ एक बहुत बड़ा न्यूज़ चैनल अंग्रेज़ी चैनल है जिसका फिर से मैं नाम नहीं लूँगा आप सब समझ जाएंगे नई दिल्ली में है वो और नई दिल्ली के इस टेलीविजन चैनल ने क्या किया कि इनकी एक महिला जो है संपादक थी और उन्होंने कश्मीर पर एक कार्यक्रम करना था कश्मीर में और उन्होंने उनकी टीम ने मुझे कांटेक्ट किया ये मैं 2008 की बात कर रहा हूँ और उन्होंने बोला कि कश्मीर में हम ये प्रोग्राम करेंगे कश्मीरी पंडितों को लेंगे वहाँ के लोकल लोगों को भी लेंगे और उस वक्त मैं एक संस्था चलाता था रूट्स इन कश्मीर जो कि एक अवेयरनेस कैंपेन दिल्ली विश्वविद्यालय विश्वविद्यालय में और बाकी जगहों में करती थी और उन्होंने मुझसे 10-15 लोगों के नाम लिए जिनको वो बुलाना चाहते थे और उसके बाद वो प्रोग्राम हुआ सब कुछ हुआ और मैंने देखा कि वो 10-15 लोग ना ही मैं ना ही वो 10-15 लोग उनमें से किसी को भी नहीं बुलाया गया फिर मेरी एक दोस्त थी उसी नई दिल्ली टीवी के चैनल में और उन्होंने मुझे पूछा आ, कि क्या हुआ आपने तो नाम दिए थे तो मैंने बोला आप पता करिए तो उन्होंने पता किया तो बोला कि नहीं जो आपने पंद्रह नाम दिए थे वो लोग वो नहीं चाहते थे उन्होंने वो बैन कर दिए पंद्रह लोग वो चाहते ही नहीं थे कि असली जो कश्मीरी पंडितों की बात है वो सामने आए क्योंकि हम लोग यासीन मलिक जैसे लोग जो हैं उनके खिलाफ बात करते थे गिलानी के खिलाफ बात करते थे और हम कहते थे कि यासीन मलिक को फांसी होनी चाहिए और परसों ही आपने देखा कि सबसे पहले 34 साल में पहली बार 
एक विटनेस इंडियन एयरफोर्स के सामने आए हैं और उन्होंने कहा है हाँ यही है वो यासीन मलिक जिसने चार इंडियन एयरफोर्स के लोगों को जनवरी 1990 में मारा आप सोचिए दुनिया भर में ऐसा कोई केस नहीं होगा जहां वर्दी में आपके ऑफिसर हैं उनको मारा गया है आतंकवादियों द्वारा और आपने उसके खिलाफ कोई कदम नहीं उठाया जम्मू के स्पेशल सी टाडा कोर्ट में यासीन मलिक के खिलाफ पिछले चौंतीस साल से केस चल रहा है आप सोचिए क्या स्पीडी जस्टिस होगा कि वो स्क्वाडन लीडर रवि खन्ना की जो वाइफ है वो वेट कर रही हैं जम्मू में और वो कह रही हैं कि मैं तब तक नहीं मरूंगी जब तक मेरे पति को इंसाफ नहीं मिलेगा और सरकार प्रोसिक्यूशन सीबीआई जुडिशरी कंप्लीटली विफल रहे हैं इंसाफ दिलाने में और मीडिया तो खासकर बट अब मुझे लगता है पिछले चंद सालों से कुछ जो अंश है मीडिया में वो तब भी बात कर रहे हैं कश्मीरी पंडितों के बारे में बहुत लोग सामने आए हैं डॉक्यूमेंट्रीज बनी हैं और सबसे पहले तो विवेक अग्निहोत्री ने जो ये एक मुहिम चलाई मुझे लगता है इससे बड़ा एक कंट्रीब्यूशन कश्मीरी पंडितों की जो सच्चाई है वो बताने में नहीं रहा लेकिन आज भी मुझे लगता है जो 19 जनवरी है इसको याद रखना 14 सितंबर जिसको हम आर्टियर्स डे कहते हैं उसको याद रखना और ये चीज़ याद रखना कि कश्मीरी हिंदुओं का कश्मीरी पंडितों का पहला हक तो कश्मीर पर है ही लेकिन इक्वल हक है चाहे हम अभी एग्जाइल में हों हम विस्थापन में हों लेकिन हम एक दिन कश्मीर जरूर जाएंगे और वो हक हमसे कोई नहीं ले सकता थैंक यू आदित्य फॉर डूइंग दिस अगेन एंड बीइंग हियर फॉर दिस इवेंट इट हैड इट हैज ऑलवेज बीन अ प्लेजर टू मीट यू एंड इट हैज रिमेन सो थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीवन थैंक यू